Good evening, everyone. Ooh. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday night Bible study. Before we begin, we'll bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day, and thank you for bringing us here safely to prayer meeting in our respective areas. Lord, I ask as we sing these songs, God, that you would be here in our midst, help our minds to be drawn to heaven, and everything that we have faced today, whether it was blessings or whether they were trials, I pray that we'd put them all at your feet, and we would just praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The first hymn for the evening will be hymn 245, More About Jesus. Hymn 245, More About Jesus. Once we all get there, please say amen. Hymn 245, More About Jesus. Ready? More about Jesus I would know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus and his throne. More of his holy will deserve. Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness, see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus in his word. Holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness, see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his giving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. Amen. Now let's turn to him 264, Oh, for that flame of living fire. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, and 5. Him 264, Oh, for that flame of living fire. Oh, for that flame of living fire. Which shone so bright in saints of old, which bade their souls to heaven aspire, calm in distress in danger bold. That spirit which from age to age proclaimed thy love and taught thy ways, brightened Isaiah's vivid page and breathed in David's hallowed lays. Remember, Lord, the ancient days. Renew thy work, thy grace restore. And while to thee our hearts we raise, on us thy Holy Spirit pour. Good evening. Good evening. How is everyone doing? 
where I want to welcome you to another uh, Tuesday evening prayer meeting. We are glad that you have taken the time to come and worship with us once again. Before we begin, I would like to uh, read one text found in the book of 2 Thessalonians. If you go there with me, open your Bibles to the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3. The Bible says there that God is faithful. Amen. Do you believe that? God is faithful. The Bible says, let us all read it, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish, establish you and keep you from evil. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful promise? That the Lord can keep us, establish, establish us and keep us from evil, keep us from sin. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. I do believe it. You know, I was reading the this morning, uh, the book, The Desire of Ages, and then I read, a, a, I read a, a, a sentence that really blew my mind. And if you really want to uh, perplex the enemy, if you really want to offend the enemy, you know what we must do? We must stay away from sin. And if we stay away from sin, the enemy is going to be perplexed. He's going to be offended. He's going to be upset with all of us. Look at what it says here concerning Christ when he was a child. It says, Satan was unweary in his efforts to overcome the child of Nazareth. From his early years, Jesus was guarded by heavenly angels. Amen? Amen. That means that we can also be guarded by heavenly angels. Yet his life was one long struggle against the power of darkness. And listen to this sentence that there should be upon the earth one life free from the defilement of evil was an offense and a perplexity to the prince of darkness. Isn't that amazing? Wow. The enemy was perplexed. He was offended because he could not cause Jesus to fall into sin. Can we do the same? Amen. That's what, the, that's what we read that text. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish, establish you and keep you from evil. So the Lord is able to keep us from evil, to keep us from falling. But we must believe it. Amen? All right, this time let us spend a few moments in prayer as we begin our prayer meeting this evening. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, which are in heaven, this evening we come, not in our name, but in the name of Jesus. And the only thing that we have, or the only thing that we can bring this evening, is the promises that are found on your word. Father, as we just read, the enemy was perplexed. He was offended because he could not cause Christ to fall into sin. So, Father, we come this evening and we pray that you will give us the power to live as Christ lived. We claim the promise of Jude 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Keep us, we pray. You said in your word that you're faithful and that, that you can preserve us from evil, that you can establish us. So please, we claim these promises this evening. And as we hear your word today, Help us that when we leave this place, we will leave, re-energize, recharge spiritually to continue in the battle against sin and against self. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals to hymn 477, Come Ye Disconsolate. Hymn 477. Come ye disconsolate where ye languish come to the mercy seat
light of the straying hope of the penitent faithless and pure here speaks the comforter of the Lord this evening. I'm happy to be here. I don't know about you. Amen. Amen. All right. So before we go into our season of prayer, um, I'm going to read up some names to pray for some individuals tonight uh, because we are at prayer meeting. So we want to do more praying than speaking as it were. But before we begin, I just want to read a, um, a scripture. Here, and I want to read a statement and then we'll pray. And this is found in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 37. Simple, one single text I just want to read. And I'm going to read a statement and then we'll go into a season of prayer. John chapter 6 verse 37. The Bible says, Jesus speaking here, he says, All that the Father giveth me. All that the Father giveth me. So the Father gave Christ everything. We know that. All right? Now what does Christ in turn want to give us? Everything. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, what will Christ not do? I will in no wise cast out. So what, what is our petition today? To come to what? Come to Christ. To come to Christ. And I know many of us are here, right, to hear a word from the Lord. We've come to Christ this evening, right? Not merely to hear from man, but to hear a word from the Lord. I want to read a, I want to read a statement from, I'll grab those. As the, those fall to the ground, I'll grab those afterwards. Um, this is from Desire of Ages. Thank you so much. Um, page 429. I want to read this statement and not take up too much time. But I always love quoting this statement from Desire of Ages, page 4, 429, rather, in conjunction with John 6, 37. This is what it says. Thank you. Thank you so much. It says here, in Christ. In who? In Christ, God has provided means for subduing every sinful trait. So those of you who have come tonight, even those online, feeling as if they're not worthy, that you cannot be forgiven, these statements are for you, these words are for you, because uh, there's hope in Christ tonight as we come to him, as we come to him. It says, in Christ, God has provided means for subduing every sinful trait and resist, not only subduing every trait, but resisting every temptation. So when Satan comes with his temptations, can we, can we resist? You guys don't believe the word tonight. <laughs> we can resist every temptation, friends, however strong. That means Satan has no chance when we come to Christ. Hmm? But many feel, this is where the lack comes in, but many feel. They trust our feelings and our emotions instead of trusting in Christ, right? But many feel that they lack faith, and therefore they remain away from Christ. But what does John 6 tell us to do? That we must come to Christ, right? But many feel 
that they lack faith and therefore they remain away from Christ. But Christ tonight wants us to come close to him. Yes, even under his bosom. Um, just finishing up here, it says, Let these souls who feel this way, let these souls in their helpless unworthiness cast themselves upon the mercy of their compassionate Savior. Look not to self, friends, not to self, but to Christ. He who healed the sick and cast out demons when he walked among men is the same mighty Redeemer today. Faith comes by the word of God. Then grasp his promise, and she quotes John 6, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Right? And she finishes off by saying, Cast yourself at his feet with the cry, Lord, I believe, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You can never perish while you do this. Never. Period, friends. We can pack up and go home. <laughs> All right? So our, our commission, our, our, our petition to the Lord tonight is, Lord, um, I come to thee. I come to thee, and your promise is, Lord, that you will, in no, you will in no wise cast me out. You will in no wise cast me out. So as we go throughout this evening, friends, grab these promises of the Lord because they are true, right? Once we come to Christ, we have the power to resist every temptation, however strong. That is character perfection. Can you imagine not being te Satan coming with his temptation yet having no effect on us? But what happens so many times? We fall, right? We fall into those temptations because we're weak. Sometimes we don't believe that we can overcome. Right? But it says here, cast yourself on Christ. Come to Christ in faith. Right? And we will be able to, over, to be overcomers, friends, to be overcomers. So I want to grab a hold of this promise tonight. And as we do so, I'm going to read off some names that we want to pray for this evening. Okay? All right. The first name here is Jennifer. She's praying for spiritual growth. She's also praying for asking petitions, prayers for her family and herself as well to get ready for the coming of the Lord. And she's also asking prayer for her nephew um, who just um, reached out to her a few days ago sharing that he is losing faith in God, that he's losing faith in God. Our young people need the gospel, friends. We need the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to pray for you tonight, Jennifer. Christine. Um, she's asking for prayer in, regarding, regarding, re in regards to her um, pending case for her previous employer um, about an employment bond. So we're going to lift you up in prayer tonight, uh, Christine. Trudy Ann is asking prayer for her husband as well as her sister as they seek new employment. Um, she's also asking prayers for uh, a program that um, a, study a study abroad program um, that she will grow stronger in wisdom. Let me repeat that. She's praying for her daughter who is away on a study abroad program, that she will grow stronger in wisdom and knowledge of Christ, and also for the spirit of boldness to share what she has learned um, with others. Henry is, have, has a praise report. He says, I want to praise God for permitting that our daughter be born last week, February 25th, um, her name is Abigail, and she will be, he says here, she's the one Mildred and I have been sending prayers for. Um, she was diagnosed with ventricular septal defect before she was born, um, and it happens that she was born with it. And so they're asking prayers that the Lord will continue to close the hole in her heart one day at a time, uh, and that Mildred will heal well from her surgery. So a prayer for health. Stephanie um, has a praise report. She says she wants to thank um, you so much. She wants to thank us, thank, thank us for the prayers that have been ascending on her behalf, for all the prayers. The surgery went well and was very quick. There was no tumor, but they did have to remove part of a rib. Stephanie. Um, Ros Rosalind. Rosalind has a praise report. Um, she's thanking the Lord for answered prayers and reconciliation um, with a friend, uh, and also a prayer request um, to ask for protection from the wiles of the enemy, from Satan. We all need that. We all need that. Another prayer, her, she has another prayer request for the males in her family that they become converted and allow God to teach them how to lead their families. Also praying for her sister to continue to stay strong in the Lord and allow him to guide her in health and healing 
She's also praying for her friends that they will see the truth as it is in Jesus Christ and to overcome all sins. And also she's praying, asking prayers for herself. She has an unspoken prayer request, a prayer request for ministry, job, finances, um, and also to overcome every sin and also to be aggressive as it relates to evangelism and last but not least for country property. And I have a few more prayer requests here. Um, Letitia is asking for prayer, for wisdom, for discernment, for strength, and also for finances. Maria and Denise is asking prayers for recovery from surgery. Samuel is praying for guidance for family members that they will open their hearts to the truth and be saved. Uh, Matthew is praying for obedience. He's praying for obedience. And Sister Richardson is asking prayers for family, for friends, um, as she um, is sharing the word of God, having Bible study with them, that they will um, fall upon the rock and even be broken. Receive the gospel, friends. And, as, and also, she's asking prayer for uh, more of the Holy Spirit in former, even in latter rain power. So with those names mentioned, friends, join me as we lift up um, our voices to the Lord in prayer. Um, we lift up these individuals, even lifting up ourselves. All right, so join me even now, even those online, if you can. Um, bow with me, please. <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you for the gift of life, health, and for strength, for bringing each one of us here safely in our right minds. We could be anywhere else, but by your providence and by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you've led us and you've guided us throughout the day up until this very point in time, wherein we are in your house. We're in your temple. We're in your sanctuary, Lord, and we desire to hear a word from you. We desire, dear Lord, to receive all the blessings that you have in store for each one of us. And as we have read off these prayer requests, lifting up these individuals to you, you know each one by name, by nature, even the very hairs on their head are numbered, dear Father. You are not indifferent to the needs of your children. And so as we come humbly before your throne to petition not only these names, but also all those other prayer requests, Lord, that have not been mentioned, unspoken, those here locally, even those who are now joining us who have not been able to send their prayer, prayer requests in, but they have them. And I'm so thankful, dear Father, that you are a God who knows all prayers. You know the heart. You know the heart of the matter. And so, dear Father, as we press together to your throne, humbly, dear Father, do we seek your face, praying that you'll speak to each one of us, that you'll touch each heart. As you listen to the prayer requests, Lord, that have ascended, some people are praying for um, uh, country property. Some people are praying for uh, deliverance. Some people are praying for good health, are praying for family members to be converted, for friends, for Bible study contacts. Some are praying for the gift of the Holy Spirit, dear Father. We thank you so much for your word in Luke chapter 11, which says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? And so, Father, tonight we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit, that he may convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We pray for deliverance, dear Father, not only of uh, physical deliverance, of good health, not only of uh, spiritual deliverance from the enemy, but also, dear Father, from sin, spiritual bondage to sin, Father. Each one of us fall into that category, and each one of us need deliverance. Those who are praying for health, Lord, those who have gone through surgery, we know you're the great physician. And as you healed the sick, the lame, the dumb, those possessed of demons over 2,000 years ago, we read in your word in Desire of Ages, Lord, that you are the same deliverer, same God, same Savior today. You have not changed. And so I pray, dear Father, that our faith, according to Luke chapter 17, will be increased 
increase our faith, dear Father. And you utter back the words, if you but have faith as a mustard seed. And so, dear Father, give us this experience that we are so desiring for tonight. Uh, deliverance from sin. Victory over sin. Victory out of our circumstances, dear Father. But if you have allowed those circumstances, those situations, those trials and tribulations to assail us, help us, dear Father, to be patient. Give us the power, dear Father, to hold on. We recognize we have no strength in it of ourselves, that we can boast. We have no wisdom. We have no power, dear Father, unless it comes from you. And so tonight we petition your throne. We recognize our dependence on Jesus. And we pray, dear Father, that you'll show up and that you'll show out. Cleanse us, each one of us here locally, those online. Cleanse us from all sin, dear Father, because sin cannot dwell in your presence. And so in order for us to receive those blessings, you must look upon each one of us as spotless, without blemish. And so, dear Father, that is our desire tonight. For those, Lord, who have not um, sent their prayer requests in, those who have unspoken prayer requests, we thank you that you know exactly what those, ones are, those prayer requests are. You know the heart. You know what people are going through. Uh, and even though, dear Father, we can only see the external, you see the internal. You see the internal struggle. And some are going through worse crises than others, yet we are all going through something. And we have one common goal, dear Father, and that is to get victory, and that is to make it to the kingdom. So I pray that you'll help each one of us, by the sound of my voice, to be faithful. That our prayer tonight, dear Father, is to come unto you, as it says in John 6, and your promise, you have promised, and you are morally obligated to follow through with your promise, Lord, if we meet the requirement. Help us to come unto you, Lord, with faith. Not this abstract faith, but faith, Lord, that grabs your word, even though we don't see evidences of it. Give us that faith tonight, dear Father. And as the speaker of this evening comes before you, I pray, dear Lord, that you give him, him, an, him an unction of your Holy Spirit. Guide his words, his speech, his thought, that it will be edifying, encouraging, even reproof to our souls, dear Father, that we, in turn, ultimately, will be drawn closer to Jesus Christ, that as we behold Christ today, as we handle him through his word, that we will become like him. We thank you for all that you have done for us, all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, Father. We cannot murmur, we cannot complain, because we have life. And so we just press before your throne, and we recommit our lives back to you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, as you did on Pentecost, dear Father, that we may go and proclaim your word to others. We thank you for hearing, we thank you for answering. Is our prayer tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now let's turn to our next hymn for the evening. Let's turn to hymn 473, Mirror My God to Thee, hymn 473, and we'll be singing one stanza. Hymn 473. Mirror my God to Thee,
Safe to Serve Local, Safe to Serve International. I want to greet you in the name of Jesus tonight. Are you blessed so far with the prayer meeting? Yes. Amen, amen. And uh, this is God's grace. It's God's intention to extend his blessing by sharing his word with you tonight. Now, before we start, let's um, kneel down. Those who cannot kneel, we can just bow down and uh, talk with God so we can receive a special blessing tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, at this moment, we are here in your house to spend time with you. Many of us have left their personal activities because the church has called for a meeting, prayer meeting. And we're praying you that we really meet you tonight. And at the end of this study tonight, we can individually say, surely we have been with Jesus. Forgive us our sins, purify us, sanctify us, give us understanding, in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. All right. Actually, this is important to pray because these day, in these last days, we cannot make it without prayer. We cannot make it without prayer. But many times, you know, we are praying Jesus and it is without the understanding of what prayer is. Prayer, we are told, is the opening of the heart to God as a friend. And this is very important to understand. So if we are not a true friend of Jesus, our prayer may be without power. So we have to understand to befriend Jesus. When I say to befriend Jesus, Jesus has already befriended us. Jesus has befriended the whole world. He came and died for us. We're going to see that. But are you a true friend of Jesus? In other words, do you have a two-way friendship with Jesus? Or is it just a one-way friendship with Jesus? If it's a one-way, it's just Jesus, your friend. And you, Jesus cannot call you his friend. Or you cannot identify yourself as Jesus' friend. And this is what we're going to see tonight. I'm laying down the plan, the blueprint before you so, we can, so you can walk with me as we go in this sermon. Because people are calling themselves Christians, praying God for specific blessings while, while they're praying, and they are not friends of Jesus. And it's happening around us. Look at this. We saw what prayer is, and we, Jesus, he taught his disciples how to pray. So, as we're saying that, based on our context, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, and we understand prayer is the opening of the heart to God as a friend, it, now, what it means, Jesus was teaching his disciples how to befriend him and his father. And in the article on your screen, go on your screen, and you see that Christians, how they're telling Christians that they should engage in with Hollywood. And these, they, they, they tell him, this is how they can gain the world. Look at that. First paragraph. This is from, this is from Christianity, Christian Post. Christianity and the film industry have long had a complicated and sometimes hostile relationship with one another. So in other world, back then, they're telling us Christianity and the world, they didn't used to be friends. But what's happening today? A change has come. Second paragraph. All right. We are told that it's a man, it's a man in the, in the industry. It's in the, it's in, it, it's in a university, Liberty University. His name is Stephen Schultz. And we are told this man, he's encouraging Christians to become, to be into Christian, to be into, into, Hollywood, he's telling, instead of retreating from the entertainment industry, 
Stephen Schultz, Executive Director of the um, Cinematic Arts Department at Liberty University, he encourages Christians to become active participants in it. In what? In Hollywood. Is this how you can win the world to the church? To be, is this how you befriend the world? Look at this again. It's not just in the world. Let the world be the world. But what's happening also in our church? Look at that. Pioneer. Memorial looks for new youth pastor. And what is the qualification? Must be a woman. Is this God's word? No. Must be a woman. Um, it says our new youth pastor will be a woman. In a few days, the conference will be interviewing several women pastor candidates, any of whom will serve the youth of this congregation with passion and excellence. And this is a Seventh-day Adventist church. And now this is how they want to unite with each other in order to gain the world. And this is wrong. And let me say this, that some people in the Bible, Jesus called them friends. And they were not true friends of Jesus. Can you give me one of the disciples of Jesus, which Jesus identified as friend? Judas. Judas. All right. Let's go there. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. You're going to see that Jesus, he identified Judas as a friend. But what kind of friendship was this? Was it a two-way friendship or a one-way friendship? Matthew 26 and verse number, verse number 40, 47, we see that Judas, he came with the multitude, with the mob. They came with swords and staves, you know, to capture Jesus. And in verse number 50, Jesus spoke with Judas, Jesus, and Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? And then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Judas called a friend of Jesus, and yet he was a betrayer. Is this you today? Being called Christians? Being called Seventh-day Adventists? And yet you are a betrayer every single day? When they see, if you're in your closet, if Jesus would come to would walk in that congregation today, he would say, you are a betrayer. Is this you today? Is this you? All right. And Judas, we are told in the Bible, Judas, after he betrayed Jesus, when he saw what was happening Jesus, to Jesus, he even went and prayed to Jesus, please forgive, him, forgive me. But it was too late, too late for Judas. Look at this, in the desire of ages. The desire of ages, um, we see that one statement is quoted here. It's in Matthew 27, verse 4. Judas came and prayed. He said, I have seen. He, knowed he, had, he knew that he had seen. But did, did Judas receive forgiveness? No, he did not. He even prayed Jesus. Look at that. Desire of ages. Page 722 now, and paragraph 2, we are told, Judas now cast himself at the feet of Jesus, acknowledging him to be the Son of God, and entreated him to deliver himself. But he delivered Jesus to the mob, to the priests, and later on to Pilate by and by, right? But now he's telling Jesus to save himself. What was the answer of Jesus? He says, the Savior did not reproach his betrayer. He knew that Judas did not repent. His confession was forced from his guilty soul by an awful sense of condemnation and looking for of judgment. What scripture is that, if you know it? What scripture is that? That's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26, 27, when you sin after knowing the law. But he felt no deep heartbreaking grief that he had betrayed the spotless son of God and denied the Holy One of Israel. Yet, Jesus spoke no word of condemnation. He looked pityingly upon Judas and said, For this hour came I into the world. This is how Jesus looked unto Judas. 
And Judas was entitled as what? A friend. A friend. And did Judas understand what being a true friend of God is? Yes, he knew. And we're going to see that. Because Jesus calls friends those who know his will. This is who Jesus identified as his friend. And another account in the Bible, we see, we see Jesus identify someone as friend, yet was being rejected. Well, let me ask you. Give me another one. Somebody in the Bible identify as a friend and yet being rejected. Give me one. At the wedding feast, yes. Where do we find that? This is Matthew 22. I like that. Matthew chapter 22 now. Matthew 22, we see in the parable of the wedding, the wedding feast, and Jesus was speaking into parable with um, his disciples and those around him who were listening to him. And he gave the parable of a king who was having a marriage for his son. I hope those who are online are following with me also. In verse number three, he sent his servant to call them that were beaten to the wedding, and they would not come. All right? In verse number eight now, it says, the king, again, the king said he, then said he to his servant, the wedding is ready, but they which were beaten were not worthy. He told his servants, go ye therefore, verse 9, go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, be to the marriage. Now they went, you know, gathered people, you know, in the highways and byways. Verse 11 now, we are told, and when the king came to see the guest, he, f he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. No wedding garment. Now, how was that man identified in this parable? How was that man identified? Verse number 12. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. I wonder why he was speechless. He had no word for excuse. No word to defend himself. I wonder why. I wonder why. Because he knew what to do. And let's confirm that. Because in the Bible, we are told that Jesus calls friends those who know his Father's will. Let's turn to John 15 to confirm that. John chapter 15 and verse 15, we're going to see that those who are identified as friends by Jesus, these are those that who knows what Jesus what Jesus got from his father. They know the father's will. And Jesus expects them to fulfill his father's will. And he calls them friend. But many are called friend by Jesus. It's just Jesus being their friend. They are not a friend of Jesus. And as a result, just as Judas, they pray in vain. John 15 and verse number 15. Look at this. Let's read together. It says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I, I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. So a friend knows the Father's will. And Jesus expects that friend to fulfill the Father's will. And this is how you will befriend Jesus back. But people, many times, you know, we have one-way relationship with Jesus. And all of us are in need of a two-way relationship with Jesus. If you think you, uh, you have no need of that, guess what? You deceive yourself. You deceive yourself. Because what causes separation between us and God is seeing. Anyone has not seen? So all of us are in need of this relationship with Jesus. A two-way relationship, not a one-way relationship. And this is what Jesus wants to have with us, a two-way relationship. And now, 
Judas, we saw that Judas was called a friend by Jesus, but yet not a true friend. One-way relationship. We saw this man in Matthew 22, the man in the parable of the wedding garment, identified as friend, but what kind of, what kind of relationship? A one-way relationship. And the man was speechless. And now, Jesus is calling us now to have a two-way relationship with him, not a one-way relationship. And does Jesus tell us the truth? Yes. Do we know the truth? We sh yes. We know the truth. Jesus has told us the truth. And he expects that we obey him. He expects we obey him. Now, in John chapter 8, we see as well Jesus talking to the, to the Israelites. Jesus talking to the Israelites, and yet they were telling Jesus that we are Abraham's seed. And yet, they say, we, we are not in bondage. We are Abraham's seed. And Jesus is telling them that, but you know the truth, yet you're not obeying the truth. That's verse number 32. Let's go there. John chapter 8 and verse number 32. And Jesus is, is telling us the only way we can become free, being free, that means having a two-way two relationship with Jesus, being free from sin, Jesus is, is telling us is to know the truth and also to practice the truth. We're going to see the principle right here in John 8, verse 32. Starting verse 32, of course. Verse number 32. It says, Jesus talking to the Jews which believe on him, based on verse 31. Verse 32 now. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they say that. They don't understand. You say that we need to be free, but we were never in bondage. We are Abraham's seed. But look at that. Verse number 37, what was the answer of Jesus to this affirmation from them? Verse number 37, Jesus talking. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. And you are talking that you are Abraham's seed? Verse number 39 now, they answered, and talking to Jesus, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. Verse 40, But you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. And in the Bible, we see that Abraham was called what? A friend of God. That means Abraham practiced the truth. He did not disobey the truth that he knew. Abraham. And that's why I love that statement in consoles to parents, teachers, and students, page 97, that says, if we know the truth, it is because we practice it. This is how we know the truth. If we don't practice the truth, it's not, we don't know it. We don't know it, actually. Now, let me ask you a question. Between Jesus and us, between Jesus and us, who befriended who first? Who befriended who first? Jesus. How do we know that? John 3.16. All right. I, I, I hear that. John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All right. No, no. That verse doesn't say that um, Jesus became our friend. That verse doesn't say that. Now, how do, we, how do you show that loving someone is befriending that person? Oh, you are sharp tonight. John 15, 13. All right, our sister said John 15 and verse 13. Let's go there. John 15, verse 13. Because it's step by steps. We have to, we have to share the truth step by step. Befriending someone means to love that person. All right, John 15, 13. Let's look at that. It says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Did Jesus lay down his life for us? Yes. And now we can connect with the scripture, 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 19, that say what? 
We love him because he first loved us. So Jesus befriending us so that we may see the need to befriend him back. And then our prayer life will never be the same. Because what is prayer again? Prayer is what again? Is the opening of the heart to God as what? As a friend. And so we need to understand how to become a friend of God in order to have a successful prayer life. This is what we need to understand. And this is what we'll focus on tonight. We're, fo we're focusing on tonight. To be a friend of Jesus. So Jesus befriended us. Now we have to befriend him back. This is what he expects of us. Now, when Jesus befriends us, now for him to befriend us back, now we are told that Jesus, in, in John 3 verse 16, I like that scripture that you share, God so loved the world. Now, can we interpret that as only God only loved the world and not the church? God also loved his church. He loved his people. Did he die for his church also? Did he befriend his church also? Yes. And how can we confirm that Jesus also died for his church also? He came to die for his church. Ephesians 5. Or Ephesians 5, yes, he came to die for his church also, this scripture. And also, well, my scripture, my scripture is in, is in uh, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. That say his name shall be, called, shall, be, shall be called what? Jesus for his people from their sins. So Jesus... From the, from the beginning of his ministry, from the announcement of his ministry, we are told that Jesus came to die for his people, his church. But what was the answer of his people to him? They crucified him. So now we see we are not exempt. Are we still sinners today? Even as God's church? Are we still sinners today? So do we need to befriend Jesus back again? Yes, we do. We're still sinners. Even God's church, we are told that every time we sin, we crucify Jesus afresh. So we need to befriend Jesus back. We need to befriend him back. Now, we see that there is, a, we, 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 we are told that in the Bible that Abraham was called a friend of God, right? Abraham called a friend of God. Now, there are a set of events in the life of Abraham that made God call him a friend of God. God Abraham was not just entitled a friend of God from the beginning. He says some events happen, and then by and by, after those events, and Abraham now was pointing by God now, by God as a friend of God. Abraham, look at that. Where, do we, where in the Bible do we find that Abraham identified as a friend of God? Hmm? Abraham as a friend of God. James chapter 2. Let's turn there with me. James chapter 2. Abraham identified as a friend of God. And let's see what Abraham did that caused Jesus to call him a friend of God. Because the, the example of Abraham is for us today. We're going to see that. The Bible tells us that. The example of Abraham is not just for Abraham. It's for us today. James chapter 2. And let's look at, look at verse number 23. Verse 23. We are told, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called what? He was called the friend of God. The friend of God. Now James, the apostle James, he said this scripture was fulfilled. That means James is referring to a scripture that was written before. That, that says Abraham believed in God. Now where do we find that scripture which the apostle James is referring to? That says Abraham believed in God. That scripture doesn't say Abraham was called the friend of God. James is adding that. 
However, the scripture says, Abraham believed in God. All right. It's in Genesis 15. All right. Let's go there now. Genesis 15. Because we want to we want to look at the life of Abraham and see how did he befriend God back. And this is the example we want to follow so we can become true friends of God. Not friends like Judas. Not friends like the man without the wedding garment in Matthew 22. But true friend of God as Abraham was. Genesis chapter 15. Let's go there. Genesis 15. And we want to see what happened in the life of Abraham that made God to identify him as the friend of God. Genesis chapter 15. Verse number 6. Let's read that scripture now. That says Abraham was identified as the friend of God. Genesis 15. And verse number 6, we are told, and he, talking about Abraham, well, if you, wanna, if you want context now to understand that, here the scripture is, is, is talking about Abraham, look at verse 1, right? It's God talking to Abraham. Now, verse number 6, it says, and he believed in, in, to, in the Lord, and he counted, on, he counted it to him for righteousness. So did Abraham believe in God? And then God called him the friend of God. Now, what in the life of Abraham caused God to identify him as a friend? Now, before that, what in the life of Abraham caused him to believe in God now? What happened in the life of Abraham? Let's look at that. Context. Context, right? Genesis 15. Look at. Let's start in verse number, verse number 1. God came and spoke to Abraham, the latter part of the verse, the latter part of the verse where God is talking. He says, fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield. Well, his name was not changed yet um, into Abraham, which was done in chapter 17. All right. Verse, verse number one, God speaking to, Ab, to, to Abraham, Abraham, he says, I am that shield and thy exceeding great reward. Verse 2, and Abraham said, said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? So Abraham didn't have any children. And God told Abraham that you are going to become many nations. So how is that um, promise going to be fulfilled in the life of Abraham? I wonder, I, I was reading this, and I was thinking, what was happening in the mind of Abraham? The man has no children, and you tell him that he's going to become many nations. And for Abraham, he's old already, old already, and we're going to see that. The man was old, his wife old, and then you telling him he's going to have a child in his old age? Even science cannot explain that. No science can explain that. That's why it's dangerous to put science above the Bible. Dangerous. Because many things, many things in the Bible, if you try to look at science, you're going to lose faith in God. So it's faith first. And then anything that science can back, anything that's, that the Bible can back up in science, then you can, you can agree with it. If the Bible cannot back up the science, stay away from it. Stay away from it. All right, verse number, verse number four now. God speaking, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be that hair, talking about Eliezer, this shall not be that hair, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be that hair. And God made him come out and look unto the star and say, look at them. If you cannot count the star, the stars in heaven, this is how your inheritance is, go is going to be. Your posterity is going to be. Abraham could not reconcile this in his mind. Even Abraham. Now, was this, was this the first time Abraham heard this promise? Was this the first time? No. From the, very, from the very first time when God called Abraham, God gave him that promise. God gave him that promise. Let's look at that. Genesis 12. That's when Abraham was called. Genesis chapter 12. 
Abraham was called, and God gave him a promise, saying that, look at that, verse number 2, God speaking to Abraham after he called him, and he's, God says, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, Abraham heard that promise, but what did Abraham do? After he heard the repetition of this promise in Genesis 15, what did Abraham do? He tried to accomplish the promise in his own way, not God's way. He couldn't wait for God. Could not wait. Forgot that. And, and let me ask you another question now. Between Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, did God give Abraham evidence that um, age doesn't matter, right? Science doesn't matter. I'm the Lord, and that whatever I say, I can do. Did God give Abraham evidence of that? What happened in Genesis chapter, Genesis 14? Did God, you know, work out a great victory with Abraham and his servants? So did Abraham have evidence that God can work out this miracle in his body? In, Sarah bodies, in Sarah's body also? Yes, he had evidence. Genesis 14, did God deliver um, the king of Sodom, king of Adma, Gomorrah, Zeboim, and Zohar also? He delivered them out of the other kings who came and attacked them. And do you know how many, how many soldiers Abraham had? How many soldiers Abraham had? Verse number 14, in Genesis 14, Verse number 14, he says, And when Abraham heard that, his brother, talking about Lot and his family, his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. 318. Against how many kings? How many kings now? Against four kings. Four kings with their many nations, with their bands of soldiers. Abraham had only 318 soldiers. Look at that, verse number one. Let's see how many, let's see how, how big a multitude that Abraham fought with his, with his band. I call him band. With, with his band of only 318 servants. Verse number one. And it came to pass. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, are your king of Elazar, Shedolomer, king of Elam, and, and Tidal, king of nations. Nations now. And these, they made war against Sodom and Gomorrah and all the nations around them. Four kings against Abraham and his band of 318 servants. And did God work out a miracle? With Abraham and his servant. Look at that. Verse number 15. And he, talking about Abraham now, and he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Abraham, with a band of 318 servants. Trained servants, though. Trained servants. I mean, we could preach about this scripture only because they were trained in, in Abraham's house. They were trained servants. And Abraham, he delivered his brother Lot and all the other captive with his band. And that, that should be enough for Abraham to believe the second time when God Gave him the promise again. That should be enough. And that's why we are told that, you know, we love him because he first loved us. God gave us evidences in our life that he loves us. So what does he expect in us again? To love him back. And if you love him, what you got to do? What you have to do? You have to keep his commitment. 
But did Abraham fail afterward? Did Abraham fail? Yes, he did. Genesis 16, look at that. Oh, Abraham received a promise. His name was not changed. Abraham. He received the promise from God. But yet, the man, despite of the evidence that God gave him in Genesis 14, with the great victory, guess what? The man, he tried to accomplish the promise his own way. Genesis 16, and from Genesis 12, before we read, from Genesis 12 to Genesis 16, you know how many years elapsed? You know how many years elapsed? At least, at least, let's say at least. From Genesis 12 to Genesis 16, at least 10 years elapsed. 10 years, 10 years elapsed. We're going to see that. Genesis 16, verse 1, um, Sarah was barren, could not bear children. And Sarah told Abraham, you know what? I'm too old. You know, you know, just go to that woman and try to have a child. And did Abraham listen to his wife instead of listening to God? Who received the promise, Sarah or Abraham? Abraham received the promise. You know, which, which account this will matter us now? Huh? Somebody who, who listened to his wife instead of saying to God? The first, scene, the first scene, Adam and Eve. God told Adam what not to do, and who did he listen to? So much you could say about that. Now, Abraham answered, Abraham listened to Sarah, all right? And verse number, verse number, verse number, verse number three. Verse number three, and Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt how many years? Ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. And he went into a girl, and she conceived, and they had Ishmael. They had Ishmael. So Abraham... Though he got the promise from God, yet he listened to who? To his wife, and he disobeyed God. Now, this man called a friend of God. This man called a friend of God. That's the thing. This man was called a friend of God. But what does that tell us? Later on, did God, um, did God give Abraham the promise again? Later on? Did Abraham receive conversion later on? Hmm? He received conversion. Genesis 17 confirms that his name was changed from Abraham to what? Abraham now. Sarah's name was changed to what? Sarah. So the family was converted. Sarah, she had heard the promise from, from her husband, but yet her failed went down. Her faith went down. She failed. Abraham heard the promise directly from God. Heard his wife fail. But what happened later on? Were they converted? Yes, they got converted. And then now, they fixed, they put their house in order. Well, they were ready now to receive God's blessing. I wonder if Abraham had just obeyed God uh, you know, wide right away, if he had received, if he would receive his blessing wide right away. Now, God just tested Abraham with just with a little time of delay, a little time of delay, and the man just went his own way. What does that tell us today? We got to obey God in any circumstances, even though we don't see how we're going to resolve the situation. Obey God. And what, what kind of faith do we need in the last days? What kind of faith do we need in the last days? Again. Hmm? What kind of faith do we need in the last days? Based on great controversy. Huh? Great controversy. And page, uh, page 621. Hmm? What kind of faith we need in the last days? A faith that can handle weariness, delay, hunger. A faith that will not faint. Though severely tried. This is the faith that we need. 
and, and, and later on in that same page, um, um, the inspiration says that God gave us time to have this faith, to prepare for this time. This is what God does. So we need to learn from Abraham. God did not immediately fulfill his promise, but God gave a time of delay and Abraham failed. But later on, he received conversion, and he was called a friend of God. Not a one-way friendship now. It's a two-way friendship now. Two-way friendship. Not as Judah. One-way friendship. He was called friend. But what kind of friend? One-way friendship. The man with the wedding garment. He was called a friend. What kind of relationship, though? One-way friendship. Abraham, no, a two-way friendship. So I think the life of Abraham was never the same after all. And look at that. The example of Abraham, we are told, is not just for Abraham. It's also for us in the Bible. Look at that Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 and Paul is talking about the account of Abraham just to show us the importance of righteousness by faith. Romans chapter 4. Look at that. Paul is telling us that the promise that God, God, that God gave unto Abraham is not just for Abraham, it's also for us. Let's look at in verse number 13. Look at verse number 13. Romans 4 and verse number 13, it says that, For the promise that he, talking about Abraham, he should be the heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now skip on down to verse number 23. Verse number 23, it says, Now it was not written for his sake alone, not only for Abraham's sake, that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him, that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was, the, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So the example of Abraham is for us in the last days. When Jesus comes, you know how Jesus is going to represent his saints based on Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Recite with me. Here, are, here is the patience of the saint. Here are they who are Keep the commandment of God and have what? The faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus. And Abraham called the father of faith in the Bible, but the man failed at some point. He failed at some point. But God is telling you, though you're failing, even though you may be failing right now, guess what? Your case is not over yet. There's still hope for you. You just have to do like Abraham. Surrender. Just surrender. Don't worry about evidences, scientific evidences. No, don't worry about that. Just believe. Believe the word. Believe the word. If you lack faith, pray Luke 17 verse 5. Lord, increase my faith. Increase. Make it personal. Increase my faith. And God will work wonders in your life. And your prayer life will never be the same. Now, let's keep on going. Abraham now, did he, later on, Abraham now, he had enough evidences to remain faithful and not to fall again. He had evidences now. Now, and, and so we see that in the account of Abraham, that Abraham Later on, God said, I know Abraham. I know this man. He's going to come in his household after me. I wonder why God, at this moment, he had evidence now. God, I know, I know Abraham. I know this man now. Because Abraham, once he stood, he stood to never fall again because he had a foundation now in God. Abraham did not fall. Now, we all lack faith. We all need faith. We all had, um, we all became enemies of God when we fall into sin. Now, God is calling us now to befriend him back. 
So as we befriend God, but we need signs that we are befriending Jesus. We need signs. What did I say we need? We need signs. We don't have long, a long time left. So let's go to, a practical, to practical steps in our message. You know, we need signs to show that we are becoming friends of God. Because, let, let me talk to you, if you go into a school, if you go into a school and you realize that you lack, you're not learning anything, what, you, what will you do? Will you keep on going to that same school? You send, you're sending your child to school and the child, the child is not learning anything. You're going to keep on sending that, that child to the same school? So now, what should we do now? How do we apply that to ourselves? As we're walking in the school of Christ, the school of life, if we see that we are not growing spiritually, what should we do now? What should we do? Examine yourself. Paul told us that. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, he told us, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Abraham was called a friend. Now I'm telling you, examine yourself to see whether you are a friend of God. If Jesus had walked into that congregation right now, even those online, if Jesus was to look upon you right now, if you had to meet Jesus right now, would Jesus call you a friend of him? Just as Abraham. Would he call you a friend of him? Now, three signs. I had more as I was studying, but I um, summarized them into three. Three primary signs that we should see in our life that we are befriending God or we are being friend, friends of Jesus. Three primary signs. Let me, let, me, let me mention them. Let me mention them and then we're going to walk through them. First of all, we have to love God. We are to love God. That's the first one, the first sign. The second one, we are to minister to others. Minister to others. All right? We have to understand that. And also, and also, the third one, the third one, we are to accept rebukes. When we are Jesus' friend. What are those three signs did I say? Three signs. Three signs. We are to love God. Minister to others and also open to rebukes. That's how you are befriending God. Now, I won't have time to focus too much on the first because we can see that in the life of Abraham. Quickly, quickly, let's turn to, to John chapter 15. John 15, go back to John 15 because this is when Jesus identified those who are his friend. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and see how Jesus say, if you are my friend, this is how you, show you, you are showing that you are my friend. John chapter 15 and verse number, verse number 13 again. We saw this scripture, but we're going to read it again. John, John 15 verse 13, he says, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. And verse 14 says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Which scripture summarize those two scriptures? John 14, 15. If you love me, you keep my commandments. So if you are a friend of God, you have to keep God's commandment. So I'm done with that first step. First time. Second one. What was it again? The second one? Minister unto others. Minister unto others. This is why, how you show you are a friend of God. Now, let's turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke 11, to see that a true friend is ready to minister to his brothers and sisters. Luke 11. This is another parable. Jesus is speaking another parable and saying that a true friend is someone who is ready to supply to his brother's needs, to, to his sister's needs. This is, a, this is what a true friend is. Luke 11, starting in verse number 5. Verse number 5. It says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? A what? A friend. And shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. Three loaves. For a friend of mine 
in, in his journey, he has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Verse number 7, and he from within shall answer, it's, it's question still, and he from him, and he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. And verse 8, Jesus now is saying that even though this man has all this going on in his house, because he's a true friend, he's going to provide to his brother. Look at that. Verse number 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is what? Because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. A true friend. First one, it's a friend that loves God. Love God includes keep his commitments. Second one, a friend that is ready to minister to his brothers and sisters. A true friend. A friend of God. And no wonder why, in Matthew 25, when Jesus come now, how he's going to point it to those who he's going to call sheep? How he's going to point to them in Matthew 25? How is he going to make the separation between the goat on his left and the sheep on his right? How is he going to make the separation? Uh, you don't want to talk to me? We are about to be done. Don't worry. We are about to be finished. Three steps. I only have one step left. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. What will Jesus say to the sheep on his right when he comes? Verse, Matthew 25, verse number 33. It says, And he, talking about Jesus, And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. What is he going to say unto the sheep? Verse 35, talking to the sheep. It says, For I was and hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. And now, they're going to ask Jesus, when did we ever meet you and see you and do these things to you? Jesus is going to tell them in verse 40. Verse 40, in as much, last sentence, in as much as ye have done, it unto one of the least of these my brethren, he have done it unto me. God's friend. And it's not just physical needs, spiritual needs. Now, let me deal with the spiritual aspect now. Now, you know the reason why many of us, we don't want to talk about Bible with people is because we, have, we don't have the Bible, we don't have the Bible in us. People once they hear people talking about the Bible, they run away. Why? Because the first signs of, of friendship, they don't have it. Now, because they don't have the first signs, the first token of friendship, now they cannot fulfill the second one. Because how can you give Jesus if you, have, if you, if you don't have Jesus for you? How can you give Jesus? How can you give Jesus if you don't have Jesus for you? Now, that's the, that's the second one. Now, the third one, what was it again? The third one? The third one is to accept rebukes. Accept rebukes. Now, with scripture talking about friend and rebuke, friend and rebuke, hmm? let's go to Proverbs 27. Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27. When you read this, your prayer life will never be the same. Because you will accept God's will, you know, in any guise it comes. Proverbs 27, verse number 5 and verse number 6. Verse 5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So if we call Jesus friend, what if Jesus sent us rebuke in the persons of a friend of ours or a brother, a sister? How? Oh, what are you going to do? Who are you? Don't judge me. That's what people say nowadays. They hear something, you know, ah, man, this is not good, man. No, this... Don't judge me. Who are you? 
It's not me. It's the word that is speaking. It's the word. So the word, is, is God the word? Does John 1 verse 1 say that, you know, the word was God? So if we open the Bible to someone who is that, is God speaking to that person? Now, 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 we have to make sure we have to blend stern duty with what? With kindness. This is where many people, they fail. And we need the Holy Spirit for that. Stern duty with kindness. These are twin sisters. So, so we need, we need to have these three, these three signs. So when we pray now, when we pray, we are doing our meditation and we open the Bible, we see a rebuke in the Bible, what do we do? We're not going to say, I'm not there yet. I hear some people say, man, I'm not there yet. That's not for me. I'm not there yet. No. You see it, you see it in the world. What do we do? Lord, please give me strength so I, can, so I can fulfill this in the world. Give me strength. Eat for me. The whole Bible. And God is going to give you strength and you're going to see that. It's just going to become second nature in you. Things that you once hate, you now love in Jesus. Things that you once loved that were of the world, you now hate in Jesus. This is how you become God's friend. See, I have all the quote, but um, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to stick in the Bible because time is ticking. So this is how we show that we are God's friend. And many times, people, now, they want to unite with the world. Unite with the world and become friend with God. Can we stay united with the world and be friend with God based on the Bible? No. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, as we close in, we have a few scriptures that we're going to touch as we close in. James chapter 4, verse number, verse number 4. Let me see if I want to start in verse number 4. James chapter 4. And start, start in verse number I want, to ask, I want to start in verse number three because it starts with ye ask because we ask the Lord how? In prayer, right? In prayer. Verse number three. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Now, verse number four. Ye adulterers and adulteresses know you not that the friendship of the world is what? Is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore is a friend of the world is what? Is the enmity of God. So if you remain a lover of the world, what, how will your prayer life be? Unsuccessful. So we are to befriend Jesus. And then, when we are praying Jesus, we will be praying as a friend. Again, not a one-way friendship, but what? A two-way friendship. Jesus can identify you as a true friend. Not a man without the wedding garment. Not a Judas, but a true friend like Abraham was. Look at this. The last quotation I'm sharing with you. See? See how many I, I just keep. Look at this. Because many times when we're trying to win the world, you know, they deem us as, you know, we are too extreme. He says, we often hear the remark, you are too exclusive. As a people, we would make any sacrifice to save souls or lead them to the truth. But to unite with them, to unite with them, to love the things that they love and have friendship with the world, we are not. For we should then be what? Be at enmity with God. So now, what is your prayer tonight after hearing this message? What is your prayer? Lord, make me a true friend of you. See, I close my Bible. I'm done. Lord, make me a true friend of you. And naturally, we are not God's friend. We all have sin in us. No, God is here to reconcile us to himself. So, though you may see many things in your life that makes you an enemy of God, hope is not lost. So, tonight, you can become a friend of Jesus again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your word. 
We want to thank you for the hope of salvation in your word. Yes, we understand that we are all sinners. And even our righteousness is like filthy rags. So we all here, we need you. We need to befriend you again. So God, we pray in you right now to please remove anything in us that is not from you. Anything that puts us at enmity with you, please, Father, take them away. Help us to die daily so that when we rise, we will rise in Christ daily also. Anytime we go on our knees to pray you in the morning, evening, at noon, Lord, we really feel that we have met Jesus and we just became friends with Jesus. I'm praying you to reestablish the relationship that was once lost in many lives. And Lord, from tonight, just the same you did for Abraham, you may convert us again. And Lord, you can identify us as friends of God. Please be with us tonight and thank you for fulfilling this prayer in our lives. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.